Hi everyone. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Barna Pastor from uh, ETH uh, AI Center, uh, who is doing his PhD with Sven Soiken and Andreas uh, Krause. Uh, thank you very much, Barna, for accepting the invitation. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. So. Today, I will talk about a recent publication that I have done with Professor Krause and Ilya Bogunovic. Um, we, we call the paper Efficient Model-Based Multi-Agent Mean Field Reinforcement Learning, which is eventually a model-based learning protocol for mean field control. Um, at the beginning, I will just set the stage quickly about the challenges that we are trying to tackle, and then I've been introduced the algorithm itself, the theoretical implications that we have shown for this algorithm, and then also a quick um, demonstration on one of the problems that have been tackled in uh, the literature before. So starting uh, from the beginning, eventually just setting the stage, we all know that reinforcement learning has seen tremendous improvements, but mainly on the on the single agent problems. So eventually the, the, the breakthrough paper on deep reinforcement learning was mainly about reward maximization in a static environment, the Atari games in, in particular, but also we have seen a, a line of research around uh, two player zero, zero sum games which are mainly the board games such as Go, chess, and so on. And um, this line of research starting from AlphaGo to Mu0 slowly showed better and better performances with uh, less and less pre-training and additional rules hard-coded into the uh, system itself. Um, to going away from single agents, uh, to multi-agents, it's actually quite a challenging case. Um, it requires way more scalable learning solutions than uh, the algorithms that have been applied uh, to the single agent uh, problems. But they are also very rewarding in uh, uh, real applications. So let it be smart cities where you have to control autonomous cars or taxi fleets. Uh, together, or maybe social sciences where you have economic models of many interacting agents, or even in industries such as smart power grids or agriculture. So eventually having many interacting agents in one environment uh, breaks most of the assumptions that we had about stationarity in uh, the single agent case, and therefore it provides a much more challenging learning uh, problem. I will actually describe more the, uh, these challenges in a, in a bit, but first um, I would like to just simply introduce uh, a concrete example that uh, will uh, guide us through the, the algorithm and, and, the, and the challenges uh, today. So, Let's assume that you have a large field of agricultural products. You may be, you are maybe growing um, some some kind of wheat or or corn, and you want to use drones uh, to to take care of it. But whether as a monitoring tool for surveillance, but modern drones can also be used for more specific applications, such as, such as irrigation or fertilization. And there has been use cases already showing that they come with a significant uh, benefit like for example 95 percent of water saved just because uh, drones were used compared to uh, more traditional um, devices the same can be co uh, said about economic loss because if you use heavy machinery on these fields you inevitably uh, destroy some parts of the field and the crops uh, and also you need fewer uh, men uh, to to, act, to actually uh, utilize these products. So you act, there's actually a significant, almost twelve time increase in man hour efficiency just because you use drones instead of uh, traditional uh, machinery. But then 
eventually for for our our application what is important that you have a fleet of drones that you have you want to use to take care of a large uh, field of all of the crops now that we have an application that we want and the problem that we want to solve uh, i will put a little bit of formalism around it uh, and formalize this problem as a finite episodic multi-agent reinforcement learning problem. So now we have a set of drones which are which we will be indexed by i, and this, uh, the number of drones will be uh, denoted by capital N. And these are the drones that are taking care of the field, whether it is surveillance or irrigation. Uh, they will be deployed and flown around to carry out the tasks. The assume an episodic setting where, which you can think of as for example days uh, when you have to take care of the crop and the horizon is eventually let it be either minutes or hours uh, within that day uh, the important thing here is that event we consider each day to be separate and eventually the whole procedure restarts at the beginning of the day um it, what is quite special in this case is that we have uh, a continuous state space and also a continuous action space which makes the problem even harder because we, we are not uh, working on discrete uh, states and action spaces but rather this much larger and much uh, more uh, challenging environment also, for the actions, we are using uh, policies, which are a function of all of the states uh, of all of the actions. So eventually, to carry out a good action, you assume that you, you need the knowledge of every other agent on the field in order to avoid, for example, collision or just doing the same task that someone has already done before. So in order to, uh, to coordinate uh, efficiently, you actually need these uh, policies that uh, that takes into account everybody else around you. In particular, we assume that these policies are decentralized. What it means that each drone uh, has its own policy, and uh, there's no one central controller that can dictate online. Uh, the actions. So eventually, we assume that we upload these policies to the drones, and they can execute it over the span of a day. And then the next day, we might carry out some updates. But during the day, uh, the, the drones observe each others on the field, but they are not receiving information from the central controller. So this is eventually a decentralized uh, control setting. Uh, what we also in terms of rewards, we assume cooperative rewards. And this is uh, coming back to mean field control, uh, that we actually assume that the, these agents want to carry out a, a collective task instead of uh, maximizing their own uh, individual uh, rewards. Again, to carry out the good uh, rewards and avoid collision, avoid doing the same task again, we actually assume that these rewards are dependent on the whole state vector and also the action itself that uh, one agent I has taken. In terms of dynamics, this is, this is where uh, one of the main challenges uh, come in that uh, besides the, um, the state representation is that we assume that we don't know how uh, how states transition from time t to t uh, from horizon h to horizon h plus one um, we know that it is parameterized by some policy and we have an additional noise uh, uh, around it but we don't actually know the dynamics function f and we have to uh, learn these dynamics via repeated interactions in terms of what is the main objective of the whole uh, problem, it's to find these optimal policies that we can actually 
distribute to the to the drones and then they can carry out over the day to for example in, uh, uh, distribute fertilizers uh, I see that someone has a question here um, yeah I think Thanos you have a question yes I have a question just uh, yeah. I didn't get exactly the T notation in the dynamics there is H I understand that H is the episode uh, more or less no sorry oh. ah sorry sorry I missed uh, T is the yeah. episode and then H is the uh, okay it's a horizon uh, for, forget yeah. forget uh, it's just uh, the common uh, usually use T for time and I got uh, carried away but forget forget my question yeah it's I, I I I almost missed that as well. So eventually, T is for the episode, and H is for horizons. I know that sometimes T is used for as a time step notation, um, but here we we chose this notation because we also used N for the number of agents. Uh, unfortunately, there's uh, there are a couple of uh, indexes here, um, but actually, if you go to the next slide uh, about um mean mean field control some of the some of some of these indices will disappear because we get something uh, slightly simpler so eventually i i touched upon before uh the challenges of multi-agent reinforcement learning whether it's the non-stationarity there's also potentially complex information structure of which agent observes what they might not have complete observation of the whole environment we have threat assignment issues because it's usually quite hard to recover uh, if you have one uh, reward signal for all of the agents, like who is actually uh, contributed to that reward. And also we have competing incentives and goals. And the other, the other issue that I have uh, mentioned already about scalability. So eventually the scalability issue uh, is that we have an exponentially growing uh, input um, for for the for the transition dynamics f, uh, which grows exponentially in the number of agents, and as you probably know already, this this is where mean, the mean field assumptions come in and somewhat simpler, uh, somewhat makes it simpler and approximate the multi-agent reinforcement learning problem uh, by turning this vector of uh, states into a mean field distribution, which represents the distribution of, uh, of the agents themselves. So in terms of just to be precise about the assumptions, we assume that uh, these agents are identical, indistinguishable, and interchangeable, um, which mostly relates to the first three challenges, eventually, because we assume that everybody is identical, uh, these issues of, for example, complex information structure do not appear because we know that everybody sees and knows uh, the same set of information. We also assume uh, cooperation among the agents. So this is, we are considering the mean field control problem, which uh, refers to this case compared to the mean field games, which assumes uh, competitive agents. Uh, and this relates to a challenge of competing incentives and goals. So eventually we assume that everybody's trying to optimize um, a common goal instead of uh, their own selfish rewards. And finally, we assume that we have an asymptotically infinite distribution. And this is where uh, the scalability problem is addressed. So eventually, we define this mu t h, which is the distribution at episode t and uh, horizon step h, which re which represents the the state distribution of all of the um, agents in the system. And in turn, now we can actually speak about representative agent from this uh, distribution of agents instead of individual agents. So eventually, we consider one agent, the representative one, that interacts with the whole distribution of drones rather than individual uh, drones that interact with each other. We also do the same uh, reformulation for the reward function. Uh, and instead of taking into account the whole vector of states, we 
uh, use this triplet of state action and the distribution itself. In terms of the objective for this representative agent is to um, maximize the total reward over one episode. Um, in particular, this is the expected reward of the episode uh, where the expectation is taken over the initial distribution and uh, the transition stochasticity. Uh, all of the, um, the actions are taken uh, via a policy that takes into account the state and uh, the mean field distribution. The states are uh, uh, going from H to H plus one using the, the previously defined function F that we don't know, we assume to be unknown. And also we have a transition function for the, the state distributions as well. So here uh, we actually introduce the notation of this bold pi, which is just the vector of all of the policies within one episode. And we assume that even though we don't know the uh, transition function f, we know that we know the initial distribution, which, for example, in the case of the drones, it's probably the base uh, of the field where all of the uh, drones are stationed overnight. And this is fixed. So we know that in, e in each episode, this is this is where we begin. The transition function of um, the distribution is eventually just an integral over all of the uh, transitions. So we assume that every agent uses this policy pi. And if you have this uh, distribution of agents at time age and everybody takes actions uh, according to uh, the fixed policy uh, pi age, and then this uh, transition function is applied on them, what would be the next uh, state distribution at the next time step? So uh, as, as I mentioned, we are considering uh, a cooperative setting. So our um, solution concept is a social welfare of optimum, which is just the, the maximum of this uh, objective function described above. So mean field control solves uh, or alleviate some of the scalability issues, but we still have the problem of uh, the unknown dynamics uh, in the system. So we assume that this uh, function f is unknown and representative agent cannot directly optimize uh, this optimization problem because it cannot uh, unroll uh, an episode without knowing the, the distribution, uh, the transition function f. So uh, in our case, we actually, what we focus on is costly interactions with the environment. So we do not want to let these drones fly out every day and then try to optimize in the environment itself, uh, because that would be fairly costly, whether it, it is the cost of the fertilization or whether it's just the harm that they might cause on, on the crops. So we need, we, are, uh, we need a solution that is uh capable of optimizing this function uh optimizing this problem but also it's uh, it is sample efficient so we are trying to minimize at the same time the interactions uh that we have so it is eventually we try to optimize the for example the fertilization problem for the drones uh, and we try to distribute fertilizers on the field but we but we also want to minimize uh the interactions uh with with the environment so the the number of episodes where we are still unsure about uh the dynamics on the field so for this kind of dynamics that we don't know can be something like the effects of the fertilization so in order to solve this issue we are introducing the mqb ucr uh, learning protocol which is a model based learning protocol for mean field control eventually in every episode t uh, this learning protocol consists of three steps the first of them is dynamics estimation so 
when we are interacting with uh, the environment and we, for example, send out the drones, they collect some data. They collect how uh, these transitions have gone from uh, the previous time step and they can report it back to us so that we can collect the training data. And then we estimate the di this unknown function mean, and also we do some epistemic uncertainty estimation to know that it's not on to know what kind of uncertainties we have around uh, the function itself that arise from uh, the lack of data. So the epistemic uncertainty refers to uh, the uncertainty uh, due to lack of data and not the uncertainty due to the stochasticity in the environment which is modeled with the additive noise uh, in the system. The next step is the uh, policy optimization. So ba based on these estimates of mean and, and uncertainty, we actually create a confidence set of unknown dynamics. Uh, and then ba based on that confidence set, we will choose one uh, policy profile by T that will uh, be executed in, in the environment. And then, the, and then the third step is actually uh, basically uploading this policy to the drones and then letting letting them fly out to the field uh, to collect more data and, and also carry out the task. So digging deeper into these three steps, uh, the first one is the dynamics estimation. So first of all, we gather the training data, which we denote with uh, the curly D for each uh, episode T. And we take uh, the union of all of these training data sets over all of the previously uh, executed episodes. Here, just a shorthand notation with Z, we will just uh, take a little bit shorter notation on, um, on this uh, triplet S, A, and mu. And then we use a, uh, then we estimate the dynamic uh, the dynamics of this system. So eventually, with uh, m we denote the mean of the unknown dynamics, and uh, with sigma we will denote uh, the epistemic variance. So this is a variance of the function itself and not the the additive noise. So eventually, how you can think about this conceptually is that we have an unknown function. And we have a couple of training data points around it uh, that we have already sampled. And in, and in areas and in regions where we have more samples, like for example here, we will have a relatively small uh, uncertainty, uncertainty around it. While in areas like on the right hand side, we will actually see that uh, the uncertainty is larger uh, around the mean. So this, this was the first step. We, get, we collected uh, the mean and, 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 the, and the standard and the uncertainty around it. Um, and now first we have, to we have to create a confidence set of the unknown dynamics. So eventually we have this uh, curly F T minus one, which is just a confidence set with, uh, which includes uh, uh, with, with, with which is around uh, this uh, mean and standard deviation and, and uncertain, uncertainty estimate sigma. We also have a scaling factor beta, which is something that uh, is dependent on, on, on the function and the estimation procedures that, that we use. So when eventually for e we assume that we have a, um, an estimation model that is capable of uh, finding us this, uh, this uh, confidence set. And also we assume that the true function f, the unknown function is, is inside of this uh, confidence set with high probability. So that, that's eventually uh, the main step, how we create uh, this confidence set. And this is why it's called the confidence set around uh, the mean and, and uncertainties. And then based, based on this confidence set, we actually, uh, choose the policy that will be executed during the next uh, policy execution. So here, this is fairly similar to the op optimization problem that the representative agent faces with one exception that we are actually taking the maximum over this confidence set. 
um, and we use uh, the estimated function f tilde both in the transitions for the state itself and also for the for the state distribution. So eventually, we apply the optimism uh, in the face of uncertainty principle that we say that we choose the best possible uh, function from the confidence set, which includes with high probability the, the true function as well. Um, to to uh, to choose the policy t that will be executed in the next time step again. And now that we have the policy uh, pi t, we are ready to actually do one execution. So eventually, we just take the representative agent ex actions, we distribute it to all of the uh, the other drones, we upload them, and then they will go out and execute uh, the whole episode uh, on their own. So then eventually just sampling the initial states, uh, setting the initial uh, distribution to the known and fixed distribution. And then for each step age, we actually carry out all of these steps uh, for, for every agent. And then af after this, we, we get back one more uh, set of data points that we can use to update uh, the the dynamics, and then we also get back the rewards from uh, from this execution. So this this is the the whole learning procedure that goes from estimating the uncertainty to episode execution. Yes. Uh, sorry, I have a quick question on the previous yeah. slide. So uh, just to understand, so here what is unknown is really the function uh, f, and yeah. the reward, for example, is assumed to be known as well as the form of the noise. Like you know that the noise is additive and it has a certain distribution. This is known. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So we assume that we know the no that the noise is eventually a sub Gaussian with a known spread. Uh, in this paper. In in particular, we know we, we assume that the reward function is known. However, there's a straightforward um, extension where we can we can assume that the reward is unknown. And similarly, as we estimate the, the unknown function f, we, we can also estimate the unknown reward function with similar, and we eventually get similar outcomes uh, in, okay. in terms of guarantees. OK, great. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Uh, there is one more question, maybe. Yeah. It... Uh. yeah. <clears throat> Hi. So um, there is something that I don't understand. Do you assume that you can read the mu or no? Because this syntax, yeah. you don't have this, right? We assume that we that we can read, we can observe the mu. Yeah. But in practice, you actually have a histogram instead of the mu. So the, the, no? this is actually a good connection of mean field control and how it actually approximates uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. So when we optimize uh, the, the, this policy, we assume that there is a whole distribution that we act upon. And when we, when we carry out uh, the execution of the episode here, we also right now use a simulator that actually simulates the whole distribution itself. But when you actually take these uh, outcomes, like the policy P, uh, pi t, and you would apply in a real environment with a finite but large uh, population, they would be a good ap approximation to an optima optimal policy for that population as well. Okay, but so if you have like an epsilon error in practice to like calculate this mu, how does this come out? It's like you have this Lipschitz assumption, right? Um, epsilon error of what exactly? So in practice, you don't really have the mu. And if you had like an, ep ep like you have a simulated version of mu, which is a little bit off in terms of Wasserstein distance, does this give yeah. you like linear regret in the end or no? So we we don't we did not look into particularly of like what happens if we cannot observe the right mu. So right now we assume that 
even the, the, the true environment that we only interact with, but we don't know the exact dynamics, gives us back uh, the mu itself. It could be an interesting application and, and, and an interesting problem to, to solve, to see what happens if we always observe only finite, finite populations and not a whole distribution itself. Mm -hmm. But right now we assume that even the true dynamics, the true environment that we can only interact with, but we cannot, we don't know the, the true dynamics is only, uh, it, it, it returns us the distributions themselves. Okay. And in, in terms of guarantees, uh, we, ha we are actually showing in this work that uh, uh, this learning protocol, the MQBUCRR, ucrr achieves uh, an eff efficient balance between learning this unknown dynamics, the, the function f, and also optimizing the social welfare. In order to do this, we actually first define the regret as a performance measure. So eventually the regret is uh, the optimum uh, social reward that is achievable in this system. So again, the pi, pi star is the, the social welfare optimum. And then pi t is eventually uh, the reward that we observe uh, when we interact with the true environment. So this, this is directly the reward that we received from the environment once we do a policy execution. And what we care about is the sum of these regrets over capital T uh, episodes. So we execute capital T episodes and then uh, capital RT shows us that how much regret we have observed. Um, under my, my assumptions and, and standard assumptions in the uh, model-based learning uh, literature, we actually show that we have uh, a regret bound. So the, uh, up onto constant, constant factors, we actually scale uh, with beta uh, on the power of age and then square root h cube t and uh, this model complexity measure it that I will quickly describe in a second. What, what is actually interesting for us is uh, this shows us that we have a sublinear regret. So this, uh, the average regret goes to zero as t goes to infinity if uh, this information measure it and the, the beta, which is something that depends on the estimation model that, uh, that we use, scales with um, O square root of T. And uh, if you want to uh, apply to one specific uh, estimation model, like the Gaussian processes, it has been proven for this, this class of models using the most common kernels that we actually obtain this property. So why the sublinear regret is important uh, is that it actually shows us that over the, this uh, horizon of capital T, we actually converge um, to, to, the, to the optimum solution. Here, just to highlight this uh, complexity measure, so this, is, this IT uh, is something that we use to measure and quantify the learning problem. So some functions, if you have a li linear function, this is something that's easy to learn, but we might have something that is very complicated to learn if it has a large uh, freedom. Uh, so when I say learning, it means that we actually learn the unknown dynamics function. And this complexity measure eventually quantifies the worst case scenario. So what is the, the largest uncertainty that we can observe over these capital T times of episodes um, if uh, this goes, like if, if you only sample points which are the least informative uh, uh, out, out of the sets of data points. So then eventually the, this, this is the main point uh, on, the the on the theories uh, that we have proven. And it shows that the learning protocol do balance it, uh, balances the, the learning of the unknown dynamics and the social data optimization. So to actually show it, 
uh, with an example, we implemented the entropy maximization problem. So this is a problem that has been tackled by others at, uh, in the literature as well. And uh, it showcases um, uh, an, an, inter an interesting uh, challenge for uh, mean field control as well. So eventually, the setting of this problem is that we have these four rooms connected with one corridor each. And we uh, introduce this problem in the continuous state space. So agents can move around freely in, in, in this whole state space. Um, but they cannot go through the, the walls, which are represented by the white cells. The action space is eventually uh, given, given by the unit. So there is a typo here. It should be minus one and plus one. But eventually, it means that they can jump to unit uh, up or down uh, around the state space. And the dynamics is uh, simply the state plus the action. So eventually, the action uh, def uh, describes how much it moves from a certain to a certain direction. And then, of course, we apply noise on top of this. Um, and we, of course, and, and we assume that this is a dynamics that uh, the learning uh, procedure does not know initially. In, ter in terms of rewards, the individual reward is uh, the negative logarithm of the, this, uh, of the probability in and that given state. And then if you take, take it to the whole population, this gives us uh, the entropy itself. So eventually, when we talk about social maximum, this is the entropy maximization, which is achieved if the population is spread out uniformly in the whole uh, state space. So one challenging problem in, in the implementation is actually how we represent the distribution itself, because it is not, uh, uh, not, not, an, not an easy problem. So first, uh, we eventually take a histogram of unit grid size and uh, we represent uh, the, the distribution as a, as a histogram or over, over these grid size. Just to, to motivate why this is actually a challenging issue is that we have an initial distribution that is centered around the, the bottom left corner. And the, pro the, uh, the challenge is, or the objective of this problem to spread out uh, this population in the four rooms uh, uniformly, which is uh, not even possible. It, it is not possible with a random policy. So we ran a couple of simulations when the, uh, the policy was co completely random actions. And uh, this kind of uniformity was not achieved at all. So we, we actually need something that, that is more intentional of spreading them around especially since they have to go through the, the corridors. So for, for the, for the uh, results, we actually show that um, the algorithm converges quickly. So eventually, we have a benchmark, with, which is an optimization uh, with known dynamics. So we ran the same, the same optimization, uh, assuming that we know F and then used it as a benchmark of the theoretical maximum that we can achieve. Uh, this, is, this is called B, BPTT on this graph. And then you can see that eventually within 30 episodes, we achieve a fairly good convergence to this uh, optimum. At uh, the first roughly 10 episodes, it actually shows that we have a relatively large spread. spread. So here it actually uh, shows the error bars for uh, 20 independent runs. So at the initial roughly 10 episodes, there is some spread around the performance, uh, which is expected since the, uh, the algorithm has, has to learn the transition dynamics that it doesn't know initially. So it has to uh, do more uh, exploration steps. And after that, it actually can achieve, can uh, exploit more of these uh, known, known uh, dynamics and converge to, uh, to a closer optimum to, uh, to, to, to the uh, BPTT line. Um, in order to uh, contrast it with a, a model-free version, we actually used uh, 
the U2 MFQL FH algorithm, which is eventually an adaptation of the Q learning uh, procedure for the mean field control um, and, and in the episodic uh, setting. This is actually a setting that is not tackled by many in the literature, literature and this was the only uh, comparable algorithm that we could find. So what we see is that this algorithm ha significantly struggles to learn how to uh, optimize this problem. First of all, we have a, a fairly large uh, number of discrete states, states and actions pair, pairs um, that it has to learn. Uh, and the Q table uh, is, is quite large to actually learn all of these. Um, the exploration is not that simple because eventually the, 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 uh, the algorithm somehow has to, has to find out how to go to the uh, top right cell of the of the state space as well. So uh, in in the states and action pairs action pairs in that region, the the visits are quite infrequent. And also we see that deterministic policies uh, seem to struggle to spread uh, a very concentrated population on the top bottom corner, um, and uh, and and that could be also an issue for for good performance. Actually, to try to mitigate this issue of uh, deterministic policies, we, had, we implemented two versions of this algorithm. One of them that we call it standard is this, uh, the, de the deterministic policies of the Q-learning where we always took the arg maximum, while in the, the extended version, we actually assume that the actions are predefined uh, distributions over the actions, like for example, taking half of the population up and the half, half of the population to the right or, or so on. Uh, but it, it, it increased even further the, the states and action space uh, pairs and, and the Q table. So it, 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 it improved the performance slightly, but it still uh, could not converge in 10 million of steps. And that was basically where we ran out of computational power. So. In terms of, uh, we, we have seen the qualitative uh, demonstration of how it actually performed. And I have a couple of simulations here to show how it actually uh, learns. So this is, both of, both of these animations are one episode. And the first one is uh, after three episodes of learning. So this is still uh, during uh, the learning phase. And as you can see, it already knows how to spread around in the in the bottom left corner, but it has still some issues uh, over the episode. So, for example, for example, here we have seen that it actually kind of stuck in the corner, which just shows that it does not have a precise estimation of the dynamics. And the policy thought that it can go through the corridor, even though it couldn't. And at the end, we still see that. Uh, there's a large concentration in, in this cell and that cell, and, and the, the overall spread is not quite satisfactory. But if we look at something like that happened in the 26th uh, episode, where the convergence was already quite good, we will see that actually it is doing a better job at spreading around in the initially and then pushing the, the distribution through these corridors and spreading around in the uh, in the force um, rooms uniformly. And at the end of the episode, we actually get a, a relatively nice, even though not perfect uh, distribution uh, in, in the whole state space. So to conclude, just a quick recap of what we proved and what, what our contributions in this work was, is eventually we define the episodic mean field control problem with continuous states and action spaces, which to the best of my knowledge, this is the first paper to, to address to. Uh, we propose the model-based learning procedure, the MQB UCRL. Um, we showed and provided a general regret bound, which combined with the right uh, learning algorithms uh, provide sublinear regret and, and, and the quick convergence to an optimal, poly, uh, optimal solution. And at the end, we actually demonstrated the performance on the entropy maximization problem. 
In terms of where to go next and what could be a potential future works uh, following this one is eventually adopting the uh, the algorithm to the mean field game settings. So this is actually a quite challenging one uh, for model-based learning because uh, suddenly le learning the dynamics become a little bit more uh, cumbersome when you don't when you cannot assume one central uh, representative agent. Um, we we used uh, simple discretization for representing the population, but this is, I think, an area where uh, uh, it can be uh, further worked upon with other uh, representation and uh, and see how it can combine how this uh, algorithm can be combined with them. Third one, efficient planning. So even with known dynamics, it's not necessarily straightforward how to how to learn this. In our uh, experiments, we we simply assume that we have something that is differentiable. So we div we assume that the whole simulation with the approximated dynamics is a is a differentiable simulation, and we took uh, the the, the the differential with respect to the weights of our policy. Um, then again, uh, introduce constraints and safety to this problem can be uh, a, a further further issue. Like for uh, for example, in in the case of the drones, we might want to avoid flying over certain airspaces, which we know that they they are not allowed to. And of course, uh, using having more and more a variety for calibrated models, eventually models that are efficient in learning the unknown dynamics. Right now, we have experiments with Gaussian processes, and we also use uh, deep ensembles. Uh, but there, there are still lots of uh, problems where this is challenging to to find the right model and find the right solution. Um, and with that, I. I reached the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening, and um, I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, let's see other questions from the audience. Um, Zeta, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, one is very clear and in stand for presentation, and it has some questions. So uh, first, as for the episode, do you mean the episode is an is index of iteration? So for uh, for us, the episode, what we mean is eventually one one rollout. So if you think about the drones and you let let's assume that they are flying out every morning to water the plants on the field, we consider each each day to be the same but each day restarts from the same uh, same initial state so it's kind of like restarting a game so if you maybe in, in another example that might be uh, uh, more illustrative is like a game of chess like at the at the beginning of the game of chess you always have the same uh, setup and then you start playing. And once you finish the play, that's that's one episode. And then you reset the, the chessboard and you start playing again. So and that's so, the next episode. Yeah, thank you. So the episode is a typical episode in reinforcement learning. That means uh, you mm -hmm. start from the initial state and to the end, to the time horizon, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that means is that in our example, I think, uh, I remember that's only 26 episodes, you can learn a good policy. Exactly, exactly. We only use 26 episodes to uh, learn a, a fairly good policy. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Okay, but so, so another question is that, uh, are there any prerequisites about the convergence? Um, so I, the con I'm very, one slide you show the, 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 the bound of the regret. So it mm -hmm. could be a, a convergence guarantee. And yeah. what's the prerequisite of this? So what assumption you made before you got this, if you, if you want to share that? Yeah, of course. Um, so I have a 
quick outline here. So eventually we have a few assumptions about continuity of the system. So eventually we assume that uh, the dynamics, the rewards and the policies are all Lipschitz continuous. Uh, I touched upon this fact that we know that uh, the noise is a is a sigma sub Gaussian noise. So we know the spread and we know this is something that is uh, below the Gaussian curve. We have this assumption, which is the calibrated model. So this, this is eventually something that ensures that if we collect enough data, we can create this uh, confidence set from which we actually sample and maximize over uh, for the representative agent. Okay. And then we also assume that this model uh, that learns the dynamics uh, has a has a Lipschitz continuous deviation function. So they, these are the assumptions that we based upon our, our our theorem that you can see on the right hand side. Okay, so so mainly about three three points, right? The noise coverage model and a Lipschitz continuity. Exactly. Okay, and, and sorry, I had another question. So uh, I think no that question is it is a typical uh, problems uh, the common problem in the model based uh, reinforcement learning is that uh, so i remember that when you optimize the, the problems you want to bound them into the into this a certain uh, into a specific uncertainty so this uncertainty you estimate by uh, calculates the mean calculate the variance of the of the data so but here is that um, how do you know that lower uncertainty I means that lower lower variance means a, a, a perfect a better model because the model may be overfitting in this insufficient data. Do you know um, what I mean? Let let me think about it. So eventually, you you say that we collect more and more data, and yes. we overfit on those. Uh, um, yes, you overfitting. If you overfit on those data you still get a very low uncertainty and you try to automate in this but your model is not cracked yeah. so if, if you overfit on the data and you have a very low uncertainty eventually you will violate the calibrated model assumption so if if you go oh, sorry so if you go down uh, and and this value of your uncertainty uh, approaches zero eventually means that your mean becomes the uh, this is the this is the unknown function that is mm -hmm. included in this calibrated model assumption so we so if this cal if this assumption holds then your mean will be the same as uh the function itself and then when you optimize with the re representative agent eventually you will have uh, a confidence set that only includes the true function itself. And then the representative agent's problem will become the problem itself that you want to solve, but you cannot do it because you don't know what. Is is that clear or? Uh, sorry, not. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, no problem. So yeah, yeah. So, so I, mean, I mean, during your, 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 your trainings, how do you know that? During training, you don't know that you you overfit or or, or underfit it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like there is no way to actually checking it. But if you have a model that guarantees this assumption, so we are working from the assumption itself, then you know that you haven't overfitted it. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think there is one more question, uh, Anastasia. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I have a more question on like how we actually get uh, the mu right from the discretization. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can elaborate a bit more how important the discretization is. Like, for example, you can invest more data to estimate mu, right? And then how actually the computation scales, how you would expect the result would change. So how Im important actually it is. So the discretization for the implementation? For computing new, exactly. Yeah, because you don't know it in practice, right? You take it from histograms, as you said, right? And mm -hmm. um, how important the yeah. discretization? Yeah. Uh -huh. So the discretization, um, 
it's kind of like a two two-fold problem. So eventually, when when you represent the distribution, if you have a, a large enough discretization, so fine enough grid to provide you sufficient information, then then it, then it's good enough. So um, here, that that's a question whether you have uh, small enough grid points to actually learn a good policy, assuming that uh, there's no uh, errors in the simulation itself, like going from age, mu age to age plus one, the transition dynamic. Um, so that's that's more of the information quality of the of the state discretization. In terms of how you can actually simulate this, um, the, in, in the paper, there's actually a section describing it, how, how we did it. And you can uh, do something that only introduces a small uh, error uh, in in the state uh, representation. So it's not it's not something that accumulates over time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So then, for your experiments, like there is basically the way you decide what's the optimal size of discretization, right? It's not just like I don't know, like computational complexity that bumps into you and then you say, okay, that's the maximum I can use. You better choose uh, exactly like balancing this uh, better model versus uh, computation, right? You know exactly. how to... okay. Exactly, so unfortunately, this is, this is one of the cornerstones of this implementation that you have uh, a discretization and already in 2D space, it, it, it scares, uh, quite badly with the number of points if you if you take. So we have an 11 by 11 grid, and then it already has 121 uh, size to represent it. Um, we had a couple of applications in mind, for example, uh, air traffic control, where it would be interesting to use it as well. But the problem is you have already three dimensions, so the scaling really, really matters. So that's that's why actually one of the potential future works that I would be pretty much interested in is like okay how to how to use something more clever than just a discretization. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, ah, Thanos, you have a question. Um, if you want, you can unmute yourself or. Uh, uh, my, my question is, do you think you could somehow relax this calibrated model uh, assumption and leave the model deviation? Do you think like if you replace because I understand that once you have uh, something like uh, you, you start with the, with the model and you, you simulate for the model and things work very well but like if you want to apply into more real life uh, situations or to to yeah. apply to more uh, like um, outside of the situated uh, situation uh, case do you know how to like if you have any any clue how this could be relaxed so in in application um relax relaxing it and still uh having the the convergent guarantee i'm not aware of any results that 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 would show this 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 is this is a quite general uh issue in the, in the model based reinforcement learning uh field so without having such an assumption it it is almost impossible to to show any kind of guarantees in my opinion uh what happens in reality and and for example uh, developing these uh, simulations and demonstrations uh, usually ev even without explicitly checking that this assumption holds the the algorithms do show good convergence but uh, the, the short the short answer is i i don't know any any such solutions mm. And then just, just as a, as a follow-up, 
uh, I, I understood like from from your previous answer to 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 one question that the mm -hmm. basic problem is exploration. Like if you don't, if mm -hmm. you relax the assumption, and then you might uh, overfit, you might fall into into local uh, minima, and then you just get always the same uh, the same uh, the same samples, and then you 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 cannot learn effectively the the dynamics. So. Uh, basically, any other form of uh, exploration or like to re to replace or to, to kind of mix the, the part of exploration through the, the this assumption, the calibrated model assumption. So ju just on the first point about falling into a local minima. So eventually, this is, this is what we are trying to optimize. Let me just fall back a little bit here so if you always sample from the same points what would happen is that for example here you will have a very concentrated value but in in some other uh points you will still have a fairly large uncertainty so your uh the algorithm itself what what it would do is will it will know for certain that it it does not worth going to to that region because the uncertainty has already collapsed and and there and there's no way out of there but it the the uncertainty in regions where it hasn't explored yet remains high and because we are taking this optimistic view that in regions where the uncertainty is high we assume that the best possible outcome will happen eventually uh, it will sooner or later turn direction to to a region where it hasn't been so far, and assume and expects that potentially it will receive higher rewards. So, just just because the 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 model has a good fit at at a certain region, it doesn't mean that it won't explore other regions where it hasn't explored yet. Okay, very, very interesting point, uh, very interesting point. So this, this construction actually guarantees uh, enough exploration, like uh, from the, the way you construct the, the dynamics estimation, you, you guarantee that you are going to visit uh, the whole space, actually. Very interesting um, point. Yeah, uh, it, it won't necessarily guarantee a complete exploration of everywhere, like if you have already a couple of, of samples, for example, a region, and you already know that even with a high uncertainty, you won't be able to achieve a higher reward going into that, that region compared to another region where you have already done some exploration and you know for sure that you will receive better, re, better rewards even than the maximum that you could achieve in, in, in the less explored space. The algorithm will know that there is no point in going there. Eventually, this is the trade off that it tries to balance. Mm. Yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so if there are no further questions, uh, well, thank you again, Barna, for the very nice and clear talk. And thank you, everyone.